Welcome to the um, welcome to the webinar on the benefits and challenges of being a media literacy entrepreneur. I am so delighted to see so many of you joining, and I welcome you to open up the chat room and tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and where you're from. This is a networking event like no other because you are going to be amazed at the wide variety of media literacy entrepreneurs that are on the call. In fact, if you're, um, if you're joining me with your camera on, let's just put a thumbs up for those of you who identify as a media literacy entrepreneur. If you think of yourself as a media literacy entrepreneur, put your thumb in the air. Let's take a look, wow. There are a lot of you who identify as media literacy entrepreneurs, and we're really excited about that because um, we have a great plan for using our time well in the next uh, 60 minutes. Um, so um, let me just give you an overview of the plan and then, um, and then we'll get started. So I'm sharing my screen with you. Here's what, we're, what we think we're going to do. We're gonna hear from our four uh, special panel guests today, and they're going to tell us how their entrepreneurial journey first began. Then they're going to tell us a success story, something they're really proud of that was successful and how they know it was a success. Then we're gonna ask them to tell us a challenge story some of the struggles of being a media literacy entrepreneur. Then we'll think a little bit about what kind of advice uh, is useful to help people who are thinking about becoming media literacy entrepreneurs. And we'll also think more broadly about the impact, the social, political, and economic consequences to the rise of media literacy entrepreneurs, right? Because there are some consequences, maybe some expected consequences and even unexpected consequences. After 30 minutes of our discussion, our panel discussion, we're going to break into small groups. And these in these small groups, we're going to ask you and your small group to explore those same questions. And you're going to get a chance to document some of the ideas that emerge from your group using this Google slide doc deck. And then we'll come back together at the end and we'll do some reflections and we'll uh, think about what we learned together. So let's get started right away by talking to our four entrepreneurs. We'll ask each of the entrepreneurs to introduce yourself with a beginnings story telling us a little bit about how you first got started. Tell us how your entrepreneurial journey began. Uh, Tessa Joels, we'll start with you. Um, well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'm really thrilled to be here. My entrepreneurial journey started with my children in that I came out of a corporate communications background. I was a consultant for a very large uh, consulting firm and um, I was head of our communications practice. And so, of course, I felt that I knew a lot about the media world, the communications world, but I realized that my children really they didn't have any way of learning about it. And so I uh, was on their advisory board and I learned uh, about a program they were starting called Media Literacy, which none of us had ever heard of. <laughs> and so I was referred to Elizabeth Toman at the Center for Media Literacy and told that I needed to take a training class with Liz. And um, I did. And I was totally taken with media literacy and, and certainly also with Liz and the center. And Liz invited me to join her at the center, which I did. And um, my journey took off from there. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Talk about starting at the top. That is a great story. Uh, Eva, Eva, tell us your beginnings. How did you get started as a media literacy entrepreneur? Put your microphone uh, on. Okay. All right. Well, you know, I, I would say realistically, it started from birth. My mother was very good at instilling media literacy in her children. And then, yeah, I'm an introvert. So if you know anything about introverts, there's a lot of time and thinking about things. And so as I was journeying through my career, I started picking up piece, bits and pieces that I thought would be um, useful for something to do on my own. Um, it was started with working with communities for nonprofits and then um, corporate leadership development and developing communication skills and employee engagement, things like that. And I really um, wanted to, I, part, of my, part of my inspiration was working with Teach for America where I saw that my students were really being impacted with negative media messaging and didn't have the guidance to really um, deflect that. So they were internalizing the harmful messages. So I decided um, I had an opportunity to go and get my master's degree and I decided to get it in media, peace and conflict studies so that I could take all of my experiences and culminate it into something that I could use for advocacy. So that's where my journey started. Wow, I love this idea that in some ways it started at birth but that it percolated. And your description of how our identities as media literacy activists percolate and our educational journey is part of that. That was beautiful, thanks for sharing. Ian, can you tell us about your media literacy beginnings, your beginnings identi identity as a media literacy entrepreneur? Absolutely, uh, thanks for having me in. Uh, it's great to see a bunch of good friends, new friends. Um, for me, I always wanted to have a digital presence. Uh, in my doc program, I started up that typical website with our comprehensive exams and stuff like that. Um, I asked questions about, could I use that to document thinking over time? Uh, that wasn't really met in a supportive manner uh, by most people around me in my organization. They said it was a pretty bad idea to document my thinking over time and share my ideas um, that are possibly half-baked. Um, and the, 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 the tipping point for me came, two things happened within about six, eight months. One, I was helping Mozilla write the web literacy and it map and initiative as part of the community. Pretty much overnight, Doug Belshaw and others left and Mozilla changed gears, sort of smoke and mirrors. And then at the same time, my institution, uh, I started a, a teacher ed tech program that was very successful. Same thing, board of directors and the president decided we're phasing this out. And then I learned as a, as a junior scholar what phasing out means. Um, and so I had this question about, okay, well, I don't feel like my work and my ideas should die off just because entities and organizations and decision makers above me decide this is no longer the bottom line or the enrollment and stuff like that. Um, so why not share these ideas out online and sort of create that narrative so that if people meet me right now in the middle of my story, they can go back and say, well, what is this person all about? So that's wow. where it all started. What I, what I hear in that beautiful story is about courage and risk taking and wanting to make sure that you couldn't be stomped on, right? That is absolutely the need for independence. It's so powerful. Josh Way, tell us about your origin story. How did you first yeah. come to uh, think of yourself as a media literacy entrepreneur? Yeah, hello everybody. My name is Josue Munoz. Uh, I've been a storyteller for uh, a, a good portion of, uh, of my life now, my not so very long life. Um, but uh, I started off as an actor. I, I knew that I wanted to study filmmaking. Uh, I, I just, I wanted to explore mediums that allowed me to keep learning new elements and stacking them on top of each other. And, and I wanted to be in a space where the learning would never end. So I wound up uh, at the Newhouse School of Public Communications in Syracuse, New York. And um, 
it was a it was a very toxic environment for a queer Latinx person, uh, as it was a predominantly white institution, and um, there weren't a lot of support systems that helped me navigate this environment for and of storytellers. Um, and and I didn't really see stories like mine represented in my classrooms, in the in the in the textbooks, etc. I had to take a, a break from school, and I went home for a semester. And I spent that time at home with my now seven-year-old sister. And that was a lot of going back and forth and a lot of her, let's make a movie and let's, uh, let's play with this and let's do this. And, and it was funny because it quickly turned into the binary of either you and I play together or I'm going to play with my iPad. And because she was like four at the time, it was really frightening um, to, to think that she was spending more than half of her day on her tablet. And, and I knew... Um, that when I returned back to school, I wanted to engage in this conversation of how can we, uh, how can we begin to build better relationships with media and technology and, and, and kind of move beyond this, uh, the technology is the villain, the iPad is, is the villain here, and, and understand that it has nothing to do with the invention, but rather the convention of how we use the tech and media. So um, I spent the past three to four years developing workshops that kind of engage youth of different ages in this conversation. And then the coronavirus happened and um, workshops in person were kind of out of the question. So it's really been a, a matter of transitioning and, and evolving the idea of workshops and the idea of conversations around media literacy and um, making them as adaptable and as customizable for each individual participant. And, and that's really where my journey has been taking me as of late. Wow, what a great story. And I love the way in which your experience with your younger sister shaped your sense of your identity and also the sense of mission. So mm -hmm. now if you're on this call and we're so happy that so many of you are, you've just gotten a great introduction to our four panel members. We're gonna ask the panel members now to talk about an accomplishment. Tell us a short story of success. What was that success and how did you know it was successful? Who wants to go first? Jump in panel members, jump in. I'll jump in, uh, it's Tessa. And um, when I joined up with Liz Tolman, um, who in a way was the original media literacy entrepreneur, <laughs> Um, I, I certainly learned a lot from Liz, and um, uh, it was at a time when media literacy wasn't really on the radar screen uh, nationally. It was about 20 years ago, and we decided that it would be very useful for the field to have a package of materials that would be very accessible, organized, um, authentic, and useful. Uh, and so we developed what we called uh, the CML Media Lit Kit, and we um, came up with some frameworks that were classic media literacy, and um, we actually wrote a, a short book that uh, explained the basics of media literacy, and it, it really is a classic, and it's been distributed all over the world. And... Um, and so what I think of as success is that, first of all, we were able to really go through a full cycle of development of these materials. We developed the materials and we actually were able to get funding along with UCLA from the CDC to do an evaluation of the methodology that we had uh, developed and that we were um, putting forth in our frameworks and also in our curriculum. That, and, is a, that is a huge form of success, right? To be able to move through the whole process from the fundraising uh, to the implementation to the assessment. Woo, that's yeah. pretty big. Uh, Josh Clay, tell us as they, so we, <laughs> as the youngest uh, uh, panel member, the newest to the media literacy entrepreneurship scene, What's a success so far for you? Uh, yeah, I just want to say it's really humbling to be. Ah. Ooh. 
I want to say that it's it's a it's a truly an honor and it's very humbling to be in this space with uh, with legends. Uh, Renee, thank you so much for uh, for bringing me on. Um, um, and I guess I'll say a, a big success that I'm still kind of uh, embracing is um, a short film that uh, some uh, friends and collaborators uh, came together to to help kind of introduce on the way. Um, I, I released it yesterday. It was for a, a short film competition. It's 58 seconds long. Um, I'll make sure to, to include a link to the Instagram page so that y'all could check it out. Um, but it, it's been a success primarily for two reasons because uh, the, the first thing I knew that as a media entrepreneur and media educator, I, I wanted to do more than just teach and I wanted to make sure that I was practicing uh, in the process. And so to, to be able to put on my filmmaker hat on and, and string together a little visual poem that kind of got to the core of, of what's been on my mind with everything going on um, and, and promoting a message that, uh, that encourages duality, that encourages uh, kind of sitting with um, the good and the bad and, and learning to grow from that space. Mm. So uh, the, the process of creativity is really what has made it a success and knowing that and this is just the beginning. Yeah, and I hear, I can't wait to see this work, uh, but I also feel like this is also part of the figuring out your deep philosophy about this, your statement of identity about what kind of media literacy is the direction and focus of your work. That's a really important part of uh, the entrepreneurial journey. Uh, Ava, can you tell us a success story that you're proud of and how and how why you think it was successful? How, why you feel it was a success? Yeah, so this is an interesting question. I um, was giving it some thought and, and really came to the conclusion that for me anyway, in this media literacy space, um, there are a lot of intangible successes I think initially when you start up and um, some lesser tangible ones, but one tangible um, that really keeps, kept me motivated when I was first starting up was that I received a grant um, to provide community um, conversations about media literacy. Mm -hmm. And I received that grant and it made me, it validated my um, outlook, which is that so um, media literacy is a social justice issue and conscious media literacy skills are a life skill. So just getting that funding to be able to spread that message, people thought it was worthy and necessary. And so that really kept me um, buoyed for the long journey of entrepreneurship to nice. come. Nice, it's true. There's nothing like having the validation of a little funding <laughs> to realize it. Other people think this is important. Right, absolutely. Nice. Ian, tell us a success story. What was the success and how do you know it was a success? It's a tough que uh, question um, because I think that a lot of times, especially in digital spaces, we get a little bit down, especially as an entrepreneur. Um, you know, you feel like you're, you're trying to figure it out on your own. You feel like you're completely lost. Um, you're teaching yourself, okay, how do I do SEO? How do I set up WordPress? How do I do hosting? Um, how do I do marketing? I didn't go to school for any of this stuff. You are often going counter to what advisors and in our field say, and you're doing all the things that are supposedly wrong. Um, and so, you know, I was worried that I was raised on this idea that you get one good idea, you parlay that into tenure, and then you basically just wait for the end of your career. And I was like, well, I want to continue to keep growing and share ideas as they come along. And so for me, the, the success, I guess, is, is all of you. Um, it's when I go to a conference and someone comes up and says, you know, I read your blog and I learned digital badgers from that. I'm like, you read, you care what I have to say? Like, I'm, I, my family doesn't even care what I have to say. Um, you know, and then I look at um, my newsletter I started because I wanted to stay in touch with colleagues and friends as I left my old institution. And now people email me and say, hey, I subscribe to your newsletter and it's mandatory reading in my classes. And I was just like, what are you talking about? Like anyone cares anything they have to say? So yeah. that's the 
that's the really that's the the part that puts wind in your sails. Being part of a community yeah. and feeling like you are part of a community is absolutely evidence of a success. Creating community and that's evidence of success. Okay, so we're all warmed up now and we're ready to ha handle the hard question. Here it is, panel members. Tell us another story that reveals some of the challenges and struggles of being a media literacy entrepreneur. Who wants to go first? Well, I guess I'll follow the pattern and go again. <laughs> Um, honestly, for me, it's come down to one word and that's funding. Um, it's so difficult and, uh, I believe that it's because media literacy hasn't been part of the mainstream. It, it hasn't been recognized, um, by these authorities. Uh, it's been kind of counterculture. And uh, it's been, it's really tough um, in that sense. And so, especially as an independent organization, we're not affiliated with the university or, um, you know, with any other institution. And so, you know, we really do have to survive on what we can make. And also, I would say that the business models have totally changed. And uh, uh, now, the um, uh, ancillary materials market um, has just been decimated through the internet and content is really free. And that makes it really difficult as, as a media literacy entrepreneur to get paid for, for your work. Wow, great observation. And um, I'm now, um, I'm uh, tuning to the whole gallery here. We've got lots and lots of people on the call, but if you have uh, experienced a similar challenge known as the funding challenge, put your <laughs> thumbs up in the air. Yeah, some of you on this call have struggled with the funding issue. And so, uh, Tessa, you started us off with a great big giant and important challenge. Let's hear from the panel members about other challenges that you may have encountered. Who's next? I'll go. Okay. So, I mean, I think it piggybacks off of what Tessa was saying. I, I think an aspect of media literacy is that uh, is that people don't necessarily know what they don't know. And so, as that aspect of education, where we have to try to de-educate or decolonize education um, from what people think they know based on what they've learned throughout the history of media um, is a challenge. That's one part of the challenge. And the other part when it comes to um, selling that service is that for me in particular, I, I work primarily business to business and a lot of businesses would rather be reactive than proactive and making sure that they don't create mistakes or offensive content, they would rather than apologize for the misstep after it's been created and released to the public. And so for me, I, that challenges that trying to get um, companies to be proactive in creating content that's conscious or in conscious ways, um, rather than finding out later from consumer angst and anger that it wasn't. Wow, powerful. Thank you so much for sharing. Other challenges or obstacles you have experienced, panel members? Ian, Josue. I'll go because I see Josue is looking pensive. Um, for me, my challenge is that oftentimes I feel like I'm trying to straddle multiple worlds. I'm like the square peg in the round hole. Um, I go to my professional organizations and I've been told by senior scholars in my field that I'm just a mindless blogger um, and that there's no validity or reliability in what I put out on my blog and in my newsletter. At the same time, I have other scholars in my field that say um, I should not have to do both ends. You shouldn't have to worry about 
open access, open everything, and blogging and publishing. Um, I've gone into TNP meetings where on the front page, imagine all the blogging and everything in a three ring binder. And I had one front page that had, um, you know, a link to and a QR code to my blog and my Dean at the time ripped it out and crumbled it up and said, this doesn't matter. And I was like, okay. Um, but then the, the thing that heartens me is I just submitted two publications because I need to live in both worlds. Um, one journal publication, the review came back and the challenge is peer review really is dead, you know, anonymous peer review. So the, the reviewers came back and said, hey, we, we noticed a lot of this terminology in your writing um, and we ran it through the, the anti, you know, plagiarism software and it's pulling up your blog. And I said, absolutely. And, and so the, the journal said, we don't really like this. This shows that you're self-citing. Whereas another journal, I submitted a different piece to, and it came back where reviewers said, this is a, a tremendous example of the democratization of research. You should talk more about this. So my question is, Field, what do you want? What do you want from us? Do you want us to break down those silos and, and really bring our research to the people? Or do you want us to lock it up in these echo chambers? And so uh, that to me is the challenge is you play with your career. I absolutely want to underline that and say, I'm very sorry to hear that young scholars like you are still experiencing that. I feel like I have never felt like I fit in any world and always those mixed messages about what is valued and not valued. Thank you for sharing that big insight, uh, Ian. Uh, Joshua, what's a challenge you're facing now as a young entrepreneur? That you yeah, I, Every Everything that's been spoken about resonates uh, severely, um, uh, greatly, especially the point about navigating two worlds. And, and it's a big part mm -hmm. as to why I'm still kind of chewing over what master's program and, uh, and ultimately what comes next, uh, simply because I'm not ready to, to step into the echo chamber and produce all of this research and have it be for the institution and not for the audiences that I'm already engaging with. Um, but, but I'll reframe this conversation of funding and, and acknowledge that for me, there's been difficulties with the, the ethics of navigating a market when your product is critical thinking. Like, <laughs> it feels counterintuitive to be charging for such a thing. Um, but but the, I think the beauty has been adapting curriculum or adapting a toolkit to the times. And, and that's that's the service that, that, that I'm learning to, to, to charge for. Um, it is really more, there's a, a general toolkit. Um, how can we start to apply this to what's going on in the world around us to simply help us better engage and better understand um, uh, th the challenges that we're facing? And, and the challenge that kind of arises in that is, am, am I as a young entrepreneur in this, uh, in this field supposed to be creating my own toolkit or is there a better way to engage with existing organization and nonprofits to, to leverage their tools and, and simply continue to point um, folks in the direction of, of the research that's already been done as, as opposed to starting from scratch. And again, the difficulty of me charging for a service that somebody else has provided, it, it just becomes a never ending, should I, how do I, and then, and yeah. Oh, hang on, Renee, you're muted. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much. So that's actually what I appreciate about that point, Sway, is that that's really the journey that we all face all the time at every stage of our career. So now it's our time to break into breakout groups. And here's how that's going to work. I'm reminding you of the three questions we've been through before. Tell us about, tell us a beginning story. Or tell us an accomplishment story or tell us a challenge story. And these two questions are also very useful right now. What advice would you give to people thinking about becoming media literacy entrepreneurs? And the broader question, what are some of the social, political, and economic consequences to the rise of media literacy entrepreneurship? I'm going to invite you to work in your small group of about five or six people and to use these nice empty slides to make notes 
to highlight. Perhaps one member of your team will be the note taker or maybe several of you creative folks will share, add photos, um, put in ideas that emerge from your conversation. We're gonna take about 20 minutes to do that conversation. And um, let me put the, um, let me put the, um, let me put the Google Doc into the chat room and check to make sure that you can open it. So now open up the chat room and uh, put your thumb up in the air when you are able to open up that Google Doc. When that Google Doc is open, your thumb will be up and I'll know that you're ready to move into the small group breakout rooms. I see quite a lot of thumbs. I don't see everybody's thumb, but I see almost everybody's thumb. I'm going to give you about 20 minutes to work and uh, if you have trouble, use that help button and I'll come and rescue you. But otherwise, we'll have a great conversation. Make sure you introduce yourself to the people in your small group because that's part of the reason why this thing is gonna be so darn fun. All right, let's get started. The rooms are open. Click on the link to move to your small group and make some new friends. On your tablet, your mic is off. Hey, Jamie Rue. Hey, Charles Antoine. Hey, Harriet. Oh, wait a minute. Harriet. Now, hold on. You're good. Now, Tessa You're good. said my name on the other one. Hold on. I'm sorry. We can hear you now. We Hello. Hey, will you introduce yourself to me, please? Uh, Jamie Rue. Yeah. So, okay. So. Tessa, so this is my, my this is my thing. I was logged in on my laptop, but my camera would not connect. So then I logged in on my phone. And so I'm in chat in the group seven as well as this group 10. <laughs> <laughs> but they can't see me. They can only hear me. So then I came over here when I heard you say my name. Hi, Tessa. I'm Jamie Rue from Chicago. <laughs> um, I was some time ago in National Lewis. Um, and, and you wrote me a, a, a card, a thank you card for coming. It was a think tank. And um, I'm a school library media specialist um, on the South Side. And I um, also have my bachelor's in broadcast communication. So I've been a lover of music videos and commercials since a little girl. So I think that was my love of all things media. And then it just, um, still in it and i'm also an owner of a publishing company um recently so this is i'm i didn't know there was a such thing as a media literate um entrepreneur but <laughs> you clearly are one that's great harriet will you introduce yourself to us please yes i am not uh, actually at the moment uh, enter entrepreneurial i'm in amsterdam this moment um i live here in holland and i'm an advisor for a um, um, company who is um, uh, occupied with uh, education and IT. And I've met Rene last uh, year uh, because of a, a trip we made to um, 
discover several agencies and organizations um, are involved with media literacy. Excuse me for my English, it's rather rough, but... <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Your mic is off. Uh, Charles, I'm hoping you're going to introduce yourself to us. I could sense you were addressing me, but I couldn't hear you. Hi, I'm uh, so Charles Antoine Charlot. I'm based in Toronto, Canada. I grew up in France, and I've worked as a freelance journalist here. And uh, I also teach part-time in university as a contract faculty. And my area is mixed. I specialized in health and environment, urban health. And the course I teach is communication, health, and environment. So it's what's the role of the press and information in a healthy public policy process. So I, I do some media literacy. And I'm looking at pivoting because, you know, I'm, I'm tired of working for universities as a contract faculty. They just don't really value you and just your temp worker, they can just so I'm information in, management in, so in some ways that idea of the pivot is it feels like that um something that um ian said that need to be free from the kind of institutional madness yeah i can totally relate to that um so uh, Jim, as, oh, go ahead. as george Quist said it, we're trying to fight the noise but do we want to add noise <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 tricky, you know, like who are we to be better than you know, and, and with the COVID and all the conspiracies, I mean, I've lost a couple of friends because I was tired and I was trying to be, you know, educate them. And yeah, that's uh maybe a subset of the issue. The big one is do we want to contribute to the noise, we want to cut down the noise or help people hear better? It's a tough I, one. I love that metaphor, help people hear better. That is really interesting. Jamie, I want to hear more about your, you said you started a publishing company. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, um, I started r &M Publications. It is an LLC um, just this spring. Um, I'm working with a um, urban fiction author who's published adult um, novels for adults. However, um, I noticed as a school librarian, uh, students who were reluctant readers tend to like that genre, um, urban literature, especially being in Inglewood on the south side of Chicago. So working with him, we've come up with, I'm um, having him write books, um, four novels set, and we're actually, it's, there's a program from my publish, uh, publishing company called URI, Youth Urban Reading Initiative to help with reading comprehension that's just been picked up with the Chicago Housing Authority for a summer program virtually. And it involves author access and um, reading comprehension, discussion questions that we come up with for each of the chapters that's included in the book. Um, and then it goes into spoken word where they're creating creative writing and then even a spoken word performance. It's the culminating activity. So really excited but it's and my publishing company is interesting because i have a high school friend who um dr bello who created a curriculum a math curriculum for preschool using an abacus but it's infused with black history information and facts so i'm looking at curriculum to say okay we have to remix the narrative so this is really my way to try and remix the narrative to include um, stories and information by us, for us, so that we can, our youth can see themselves reflected on the written page or any text and have a sense of empowerment to say, I'm not alone. Like we were saying as a network of media specialists to feel like we're not alone. So that's, this is the way I'm figuring out how to add to the remix of the narrative. So that's my publication. So many wonderful features of your big vision, right? The idea of stories that are meaningful, the audience, the idea of involving them as authors themselves yes. in spoken word poetry, and just the nature of your collaboration with your 
uh, author partner. Yes. There's so much to love about that. Well, you are the right person at the right time in the right place with the right skills for this Thank project. You. I think that's a, a thrilling to hear. So, Thank you. Thank you. So challenges you've experienced, successes. Jamie just told a success story, I think. That's pretty cool. What uh what what were your origins? What were your most successful initiatives and what have been some of your challenges? Harriet, Charles Antoine. Harriet, you yeah. Sorry. In Holland we've got a um a lot of projects around media literacy and a, a big network in Holland. Uh, uh, with uh, 1,500 entrepreneurs and uh, journalists or uh, librarians or uh, educators who um, are going to schools to develop skills there uh, with the children. So I think that's, that's a success. And another thing is we've got a, a book um, with... Um, media literacy issues it's in europe maybe you know this one it's an um it's i know it because it's famous yes and the, uh, some um dutch people here uh, made a, a similar thing a big book uh, to educate the boards at schools and to um, sign in for the importance of uh, the issues uh, around um, disinformation and uh, media literacy in general. So I think that are two big successes here in Holland. Harriet, in a way, the whole fake news disinformation mania, which feels like now it was a million years ago, right? We've been through a, an impeachment, we've been through a, a pandemic, we've been through protests all over the world. Feels like it happened a long time ago, but that has been a big impetus in Holland to increase teachers' willingness to want to explore yes. this. Is that true? Yes. Yes. And do you think that, that that trend is likely to continue now? In yes, 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 yes. Why, why, do you, why do you think it's likely to continue? Even more now because of the uh, fake news and phishing mail mails around uh, COVID nineteen, and it's it's really necessary that we make a lot of good programs for that to um, to make them hear better here in Holland. I love the Charles Antoine uh, metaphor too. It's very yes. it's very very good. Charles, tell us a success story. Or an opportunity that is on the horizon, maybe, as you pivot. Microphone. Microphone. Mike, your mic. My turn. <laughs> um, I see myself as an information manager, really. So media literacy is part of that. Um, information management, but the one pivot I'm doing is um, I'm I'm putting together it's a bit more specialized, but a uh, a workshop for youth on harm reduction and cannabis use, because here in Canada it's it's recreational cannabis is legal, uh, you know it's even more advanced now than the Netherlands, <laughs> so uh, it's a big problem. I'm not anti cannabis. But until the age of 25, your brain is still developing. So youth needs to know. And so that's, that's commu using communication. So it's not per se media literacy, but it's also a way to how to interpret the information. Um, as far as media literacy is concerned, um, I guess it's the course I teach. I have a module and uh, I, I came across a great book uh, from an American writer that's called The Information Diet. You're probably familiar with that one. And uh, so using information as food for thoughts and talking about the information, what's your information shed, talking about watershed from a, from a natural science to a cognition, cognition. So in that sense, the whole in, what's your information shed, where is your information coming from? And is there any tainted information and what kind of filters can you put in? 
to keep the tainted info or seek healthier info, healthier food for thoughts. I think that works with, I teach a first year course, so they're, you know, 18, 19, 20. Uh, so, so maybe I, but the information diet, I did not invent it. Uh, but the information shed, building on what's your water shed, what's your air shed, what's your food shed, what's your info shed. Nice. So in some ways, the paradigm that's offered, the structural paradigm that's offered by that book is something that you can uh, use as a, a structure for your own for your own way forward. And finding missed opportunities seems to be a, a really interesting theme there. Uh, it's certainly the case that in the public health arena, public health uh, folks have always gotten the, me the media literacy message. They always understand, right? It's like the stuff you take in is like your food, right? It's your mental food, right? And the entertainment choices you make and the persuasion you get exposed to and the information you get affects your health, your mental health, right? So I think it's really interesting about thinking about how um, public health people can often easily see the value of a media literacy. And especially when it relates across all those sectors, right? Information, entertainment. Um, in a way, it's really interesting to think about how each of us in different ways has focused on different elements of that in information, entertainment, and persuasion, right? Uh, so Jamie, your, your stories are stories. They're entertaining stories, right? But built into that is advocacy, is uh, empowerment. Um, and I wonder how in the Netherlands, the uh, idea of, so information is really the big thing with dealing with the fake news and disinformation. But what about the critical analysis of entertainment? Is that, how is that part of the equation or in what ways could it be part of the equation? What are your thoughts about that? I well, think, how, go ahead. I think it should be more in the Holland. So you, so you think in Holland it's mostly focused around information right now? There, there should be more um, information uh, um, for the, the, the thing to, to be critical thinking, uh, consuming the entertainment industry, um, blah, blah, um, to protect the people not only from uh, fake news, but also from um, wrong news or... Uh... Well, I, I think the challenge right now is how, uh, how all, the, all the information channels are getting blurred. And I, I'm a big fan of the technology society. And, you know, we're moving from the industrial revolution to the digital revolution. And so now the the gatekeepers, as we call them, they're no longer powerful. Anybody can be a journalist. Anybody can can become a, a TV station and use their phone and broadcast live, which is which has brought amazing changes. You know, like the you know the Black Lives Matters and what happened in the U.S. recently. You know, if there was not any any phone recording this would have gone unnoticed. So in that sense, citizenship journalism is, is amazing, but it's also part of the problem. There's so many, so, you know, I'm just thinking out loud. I, so as, yeah, as far as entertainment, one thing that came to mind when you first asked this, I remember way back at a health communication conference, they had talked about, you know, the dedicated driver. They had lobbied and lobbied and they managed to get, um, I think it was uh, friends. In the show, in one episode, they managed to get in the script a dedicated driver character. Wow. And, and that was so powerful. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So entertainment How messages can have a really powerful impact on public health and help to promote the kind of empowered decision making. Now, I want to share with you uh, I have been in the uh, I have been in the um, in the room here 
under a slide 12. One theme of our conversation for sure was this idea as anyone can be a publisher, right? And uh, Jamie, you are the poster child for that. <laughs> but so many voices <laughs> out there, how do we help people to listen better, right? That that idea, that metaphor of the balance between, we just, just don't want to add more voices, right? We need there to be this balance out there. Are, is there one other idea that we could put in this slide to make it represent our, some big ideas that came out of our conversation? That there needs to be, um, to help people to listen better, that involves providing a, a structure, as uh, we talked about the structural paradig uh, paradigm, um, when it comes to disseminating information and gathering information. So, um, and there, that responsibility. Um, so I think like in my case, the way that I'm addressing that to help people listen better is having access to the author and having that uh, process be shared to understand really the themes that you can take away to incorporate life skills, such as uh, being a community member or courageous to speak out or um, to help someone or to take time to think before reacting. Um, so I think that those kinds of uh, experiences, especially for our youth who's, who are major consumers of uh, media, to help them, give them access to these message makers. Um, some kind of way, uh, it could, you know, with social media that can easily be done, you know, so there may be something that can be included in, in uh, the way that we share information um, individually, like there's a, a process or like structure or protocol to go along with it I, as a I, I, I really love that idea because it, 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 it basically suggests there's a creativity and the design that can support and enable this, right? And that's a unique contribution of the entrepreneur. You rock, guys. Hey, it looks like you're back. Give me a thumbs up if you're back. Are you back? All right, so now give me a, uh, a, a rating, just an honest rating on a five point scale. If that conversation was terrible or weak or boring, would you put up one finger? If it was pretty good, two fingers. If it was just okay, you know, it was good. And if it was great, uh, four fingers. And if it was really something you got there you can use, put up your fingers. So let's put up your fingers. Where are you on that? Was that a meaningful conversation for you? <laughs> Ian has 10 fingers. Rosemary has six fingers. You guys have definitely got some fingers up. Now, we'd like to hear from some people we haven't heard from now. The floor is open. Please share with us an insight on media literacy entrepreneurship. To do that, what I'd like you to do is use the, um, use the um, little signal there, if you can. Put, your, put, your, put a signal th there that says, I want to speak, your hand up or some kind of signal, or unmute your microphone and start talking. Somebody I haven't heard from yet. I have something. Um, Tessa started with this and it was uh, brought up uh, by so many people uh, around the issue of funding. And um, I'd love to hear if anyone has, I mean, I know about grants and the basic stuff, but some creative ideas about that because everybody has spoken about the issue of, of funding, but I'd love to hear some creative ways to find it and maybe how, um, because I, I, I don't like the every man for every man, woman, whatever, for, him, for themselves. I, I wonder as, 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 a, as a field, how we can collaborate to increase funding opportunities. What a great observation. And let me just say, we might need to do another webinar just on that topic. Because you're right. Why should we be competing for the small pie if we can collaborate and make the pie grow larger? You Michelle, that. you're a genius. Thanks for sharing. Who's next? Somebody I haven't heard from. 
Hi, I'm Chris. Can you hear me? Yes. So, so uh, in my group, um, uh, some of us are uh, teachers. I actually work in a library, and um, I was in a. Um, Tessa was in our group, and Tessa gave us some good advice, and I thought um, uh, uh, that has to do with um, as if we're working at schools, and we're not actually we don't necessarily think of ourselves as entrepreneurs in the usual sense. She, her advice to us, and we thought it was excellent, is that we actually think of ourselves as entrepreneurs, teaching entrepreneurs anyway, because we are introducing new ideas, we are selling uh, information to people who may not have even thought of this as a, uh, a, an actual fee, uh, somebody somebody said it before uh, an actual field that liter in which literacy is important so I think thinking all of us thinking of ourselves as uh, entrepreneurs might be an excellent uh, uh, way at least to start uh, thinking about how we approach uh, 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 information or not information um, technology literacy media literacy at uh, at our schools I think this is an absolutely huge idea. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing it. Uh, Julie Smith in the chat room says, yes, this thinking of yourself as an entrepreneur changes absolutely everything. Next, I'd like to hear from Bozena and then, um, and then Chris, uh, Chris you, ha you just uh, had your hand up. Bozena and then Michelle. Well, what I don't know whether I am the only one from Southeast Europe from a small country called Montenegro. I don't know whether someone is uh, from, from Europe. And I am the proof that uh, CML uh, story is a successful story and that, that Tessa Jolt uh, made great work. So we have in my country, media literacy as an optional regular subject in high school. Yeah. And our students uh, could choose in second or third class, it is the age of 17, 18. And they are, uh, after that, very successful on their studies. I have no problem with funding. I have problem with better teacher training mm -hmm. and switching the pedagogical paradigm uh, towards critical thinking, collaboration, uh, communication, and, uh, um, well, uh, 4C. I forgot. <laughs> Four. <laughs> so uh, thank you for open source, uh, for great ideas. And uh, you can see now that, that in one little country far away from uh, states, we can uh, use uh, uh, something you did as an entrepreneur. So thank you. Uh, uh, we follow you. And uh, I'm very close to some of you very much by internet you know <laughs> that is absolutely beautiful uh Bozena, thank you so much for sharing we'll hear from aileen aileen what's an insight that came up in your small group conversation or a thought you want to share with our our wonderful group of media literacy entrepreneurs put your microphone on aileen Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I was saying thank you so much, Renee, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm from Lebanon and uh, actually media literacy in Lebanon is not part of the curriculum. It's not part of the educational curriculum. And I think uh, uh, a very important thing that we as educators uh, should be doing is uh, trying to, to raise awareness, for, first of all, regarding media literacy, because many people here in my country, at least, do not know what media literacy is. So I think this literacy should necessarily be given to uh, teachers, students and parents. So media literacy at home is a very important part because as we all know, children continuously use media, all sorts of media, all platforms. And uh, uh, this might not be this might not always have good effects, especially if they're using uh, negative content. So I think that we should always focus on the link between media literacy and critical thinking and try to raise awareness, especially in countries that do not, you know, uh, uh, um, have this literacy in their uh, curricula. 
and wow. actually what I'm trying this is what I have been trying to do because uh, in my PhD I uh, 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 did a study on media literacy in Lebanon and it was very uh, uh, promising I had very good results and I actually uh, proposed wrote a proposal to, for the Ministry of Education and we're actually working on this now I have been giving uh, training sessions for schools, daycares, and parents all over the country. So hopefully, hopefully we'll we'll have a good result at the end. But I want to emphasize the issue of uh, using media at a very young age at home, and this is where parents, you know, have a big role. You know, there is so much work to be done that we need an army of media literacy entrepreneurs. I want to thank our special guests for today. Uh, Ava Montgomery, Josue Emmanuel Munoz, uh, Ian O'Brien, and Tessa Joles. Let's give them a round of applause for their great work. And thank you all for coming. We're gonna put the video for this recording and the beautiful slides that you created. If you have stuff you wanna share with this group, put them in the slide deck. I put the link there in the chat. Put your stuff there. I'll send out an email in a few days when we put it all up on the web for you to review and share with your colleagues. Thanks so much for being part of the uh, program today. And thanks for being a part of the Media Education Lab. Bye now. Thank you, Byron.